gather them there. But let's get to today's speaker, Craig. Uh, Craig Baird's been podcasting about Canadian history on his show, Canadian History X, since 2019. Over the course of 500 plus episodes, he's covered everything from Mr. Dress Up to Canada's history with slavery. He currently lives in Stony Plain, Alberta, and spends his days spreading Canada's history on social media and through his show. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, having me here. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking about kind of a really, a kind of a dark chapter in Canada's history, a, a monumental event that uh, a lot of people know about, but a lot of people don't know about as well. So just a quick uh, to start. Like you said, my name is Craig Baird. I was raised south of a town called Stony Plain on an acreage in Alberta, and I began my career as a computer programmer, and then I moved into journalism, and then in 2019, I started a podcast, and that's essentially what I do now for a living, is I put out Canadian history content, and my podcast, Canadian History X, it's one of the top history podcasts in Canada. It receives about 1.2 million downloads per year, and um, I've always been interested in Canadian history. I kind of got inspired to learn more about it with the Heritage Minutes and then Canada People's History. Uh, both things feature the Halifax explosion as one of the topics. So that kind of sparked my interest in Canadian history and it grew from there. So I'm going to be talking about Halifax. And in 1917, Halifax was probably one of the most important cities in North America. It was the headquarters for the Royal Navy. Uh, just prior to the outbreak of the First World War, it had gone through a huge upgrade to its harbor and its waterfront facilities. And then when war was declared, Halifax was the major jumping off point for ships in the Atlantic convoys that were sending supplies and men over to Europe. And the war brought a huge amount of change to Halifax. Its population went from about 60,000 to 65,000 by 1917. And the amount of goods going through the harbor increased by ninefold. So it was a very busy place. And another reason that so much was going on in Halifax was that all neutral ships from any port in North America had to stop in Halifax first for inspection. So by the time 1917 came along, Halifax was a world-class uh, world class port and a major naval facility during the steamship era. So in 1917, one of the biggest bits of news was the 1917 federal election. And this was one of the most contentious and divisive elections in Canadian history because of the conscription crisis and the, uh, the thought of implementing conscription to fill the ranks in Europe because so many soldiers had died. So the the ruling conservatives had actually formed into the unionist government and several liberals had actually joined that because they supported conscription. And it was led by Sir Robert Borden, who was the person on the left. He was from Halifax. He was a favorite son of Halifax. Everybody loved him, born and raised in Nova Scotia. And he'd worked for many years in Halifax before he became a politician. And he was going up against Sir Wilfrid Laurier, the guy on the right, uh, in the election, and he would win the election with a massive majority, but there were a lot of shady things that went on, a whole th bunch of things that I could talk about there, but it was it was probably one of the worst elections in Canadian history. So that brings us to the SS Emo. It was one of those ships that was in the harbor. Now, the SS Emo had been built in 1889 as part of the White Star Line, so that's the same company that built the Titanic. And when the First World War erupted, the ship became the charter for the Belgium Relief Commission, and a neutral ship, as a neutral ship, it had the Belgium Relief written on the side just to prevent German submarines from trying to sink her. And she arrived in Halifax Harbor on December 3rd for neutral inspection, so she was supposed to stay there for two days awaiting refueling and supplies. But the ship was supposed to leave the harbor on December 5th before the Mont Blanc arrived. But there was a delay in coal loads coming. So the Emo actually had to stay overnight because the submarine nets came up. And once the submarine nets came up, no ship could come into the harbor and no ship could leave the harbor. So that meant it had to wait until December 6th. Otherwise, it would have left the day before and I wouldn't be talking about this. So the Mont Blanc, uh, it had been launched several years earlier, or se at the same year as the Emo, and it was owned by French owners, but it was built in England. And she left New York on December 1st because she was joining a convoy in Halifax and was loaded with 2,925 metric tons of explosives on its way to Europe. 
But prior to the First World War, uh, a ship loaded with explosives like this one would not have been allowed in the harbor. But that was relaxed because of German submarines and the risk of ships being sunk outside the harbor. So during the First World War, this ship was allowed in, whereas any other time it would not have been. Now, due to the large number of ships in the harbor, any ship entering in and out of the Bedford Basin, they were required to pass through what was called the Narrows. So ships would have to pass on the side of the channel closest to the starboard side or right side, uh, so they could pass oncoming vessels port to port, and that kept them on their left side. Uh, they also had to move at a top speed of five knots or about 9.3 kilometers per hour in the harbor. And at 7.30 a.m., the EMO was granted clearance to leave the Bedford Basin through signals sent by the HMCS Acadia. And as the EMO started to move through the harbor, she came upon the SS Clara. And this was an American steamer that was actually on the wrong side of the harbor. So both, uh, both pilots of the ships agreed to pass starboard to starboard rather than port to port. And that pushed the EMO farther into the middle of the harbor and closer to the Dartmouth shore. And at this time, Francis McKay, who was a relatively experienced harbor pilot, was on the Mont Blanc, and his ship began moving into the harbor at 7.30 a.m., and it was the second ship actually to get into the harbor after the nets came down. So this ship would move into the Bedford Basin on the Dartmouth side of the harbor, and before long, he spotted a ship approaching 1.21 kilometers away, and that ship was the Emo. So McKay on the Mont Blanc sounded a signal whistle to indicate that his ship had the right of way, and the emo responded with two short blasts stating that it would not yield its position. In response, the Mont Blanc halted her engines and began to angle herself towards the Dartmouth side of the harbor, and as the two ships started to approach each other on a collision course, they cut their engines, but unfortunately they had inertia and momentum, so they just kept moving, albeit at a slower pace. The Emo then blasted three whistles to state that it was reversing its engines, which caused the Emo to start to swing towards the Mont Blanc. And then at 8.45 a.m., the two ships collided, but they only collided at about two kilometers per hour. So it wasn't a major collision, but it was enough that there was uh, steel on steel starting to grind against each other. So there was no real damage beyond some barrels of benzoil that actually tipped over on the deck, and that began to flow over the hold of the Mont Blanc. So the Emo restarted its engines at this point and began to back away from the Mont Blanc. And then when that happened, the two ships were grinding against each other, and that created sparks. And those sparks ignited the benzoil, and a fire quickly started at the waterline of the Mont Blanc and then traveled up the side of the ship. So the captain of the Mont Blanc knew exactly what was about to happen, and he was sure the ship was going to explode, so he ordered the crew to abandon the ship. And around this time, people started to gather on the shore of the, har uh, shore of the harbor at their windows to watch this fire burning in the harbor. They had no idea what was on the ship. They just thought it was a ship that was burning in the harbor, and there wasn't much going on, so they decided to, to gather and start taking a look. So as the crew of the Mont Blanc abandoned the ship, they started to yell to people on shore that the, uh, the ship was loaded with explosives and ships were still coming in to kind of help. You had firefighter ships coming in to fight the fire and they couldn't hear the crew of the Mont Blanc yelling for them to get away. So with all those ships... Uh, with several ships starting to make their way towards the Mont Blanc, uh, the ship started to drift towards Pier 6 on the Halifax side. So a man named Vincent Coleman, he was working in the telegraph office, and he was about 750 feet away from Pier 6. So uh, you, you've probably seen the Heritage Minute, which is kind of a dramatized version of this. But he saw a sailor uh, running by, and that sailor told him that the cargo burning in the Mont Blanc was explosives. So Coleman quickly realized that there was a huge amount of danger to this, and he knew trains were starting to arrive in Halifax, including one from St. John. So he returned to his post and he sent out a message and there's several variations of this message, but the most common relation has it saying this. Hold up the train, ammunition ship of fire and harbor making for Pier 6 and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. So then at 9.04 a.m., the fire on the Mont Blanc, which at this point had spread through the entire ship, was burning 
ferociously and it ignited the cargo of the high explosives. So in seconds, the entire ship was just blown to pieces and a blast wave shot out from the ship at a speed of about one kilometer per second. And at the moment of detona detonation, where the Mont Blanc was, uh, it was actually warm to about 5,000 degrees Celsius with the pressure of a few thousand atmospheres right at the point of ignition. So it was actually hotter than the surface of the sun uh, at that point. It was only for a fraction of a second. But also the bottom of Halifax Harbor was suddenly exposed to the air because of the water displacement. And all of that water came surging back into this void. And that produced a tsunami that rose as high as 60 feet above the high water mark on the Halifax side of the harbor. So a blast cloud exploded into the air. It rose to 11,800 feet, and the blast itself was actually felt as far away as Cape Breton, which was about 200 kilometers, as well as Prince Edward Island, about 180 kilometers away. In fact, there are reports of uh, 100 kilometers away windows actually being blown out by this explosion. So moments after the explosion, and with this blast wave shooting out, 400 acres of land was just completely leveled by the explosion almost instantaneously. So for the ships in uh, the ships near the Mont Blanc, the blast was completely devastating. The Mont Blanc was completely blasted to smithereens. And this actually caused hot shards of iron to start falling on Halifax, which was uniting fires throughout the entire city. And the 90 millimeter gun of the Mont Blanc landed 5.6 kilometers away. And while its anchor, which weighed about half a ton, landed 3.2 kilometers away. And then other pieces, uh, steel plating, shrapnel, were found as far away as eight kilometers from the blast zone. There were reports that 56 kilometers away uh, from the blast, a barn was lifted off of, it, off of its foundations, but that could just be hearsay and uh, tales kind of expanding over time. There's nothing to really back that up. So the Emo, uh, despite its relative close proximity, it was thrown onto the shore by the tsunami, but it wasn't heavily damaged. That's actually a picture of it. But the blast killed everybody on the high flyer, except for one person. Uh, the only person to survive was William Becker. Uh, he was injured and he had to swim to the Dartmouth shore. Two crew on a whaler survived for just a few minutes before they died as they were pulled to shore. On the Stella Marie, 21 of the 26 men were killed, and the ship was really damaged and thrown onto the shore by the tsunami. One of the survivors on that ship was Walter Brannan, who had been in the hold and or had been thrown into the hold by the blast and that ended up saving his life. And then on the Mont Blanc, the crew were actually able to get to safety, and only one of the crew was actually killed in the blast. So out at sea, about 72 kilometers away from Halifax, there were two American vessels that were coming in, and they felt the shock of the blast. And the chief officer actually thought they had struck a mine because that's how much it shook the ship. And then he saw on the horizon, uh, a ship on, a, on the horizon, so he believed they'd been fired upon. They hadn't realized at this moment that a massive explosion had occurred in Halifax, but they soon would. So in Halifax, it was complete devastation. A total of 1,600 people were killed instantly, and then there were 9,000 injured, uh, 300 of whom actually died later. And then in a radius of 2.6 kilometers, 12,000 buildings were completely destroyed or heavily damaged, and 1,630 homes were destroyed by fires in the explosion, which left 6,000 homeless and 25,000 people without enough shelter for the winter. So in all, the blast caused about $35 million in damages, which is about $607 million today. So even adjusting for inflation, it's one of the costliest disasters in Canadian history. So William Barton, he was a traveling auditor at the Imperial Munitions Board, and he was having breakfast at the Halifax Hotel when the explosion happened. And he said, in 10 seconds, it was all over. A low rumbling, a quake shock with everything vibrating, then an indescribable noise, followed by the fall of plaster and the smashing of glass. In such moments, the human mind does not hesitate. A cry went up, a German bomb, a rush for the door, headlong down the hallway amid falling pictures, glass, plaster, to the swing doors of a few seconds before, now ripped from their hinges, through great projecting triangle pieces of glass in the street. <laughs> 
uh, John Tappan. He was a 19 year old apprentice pipe fitter and he was working in the engine room on a ship that was anchored in Halifax Harbor. And someone came running in that two vessels had collided. So he went on deck to see the emo and the burning Mont Blanc uh, drifting apart. And the last thing that he remembered was watching that ship. And when the explosion happened, he was thrown down the corridor into the interior of the ship. So he said decades later, when I regained my senses, I noticed all the buttons on my vest had been blown off. So he climbed back up onto the deck and he found that falling into the hold had actually saved his life because most of his coworkers had been killed in the blast. So for all those people who were standing at their windows and they were watching this fire burn, the blast hit their homes and smashed the windows. And that sent pieces of broken glass straight into their eyes. And it blinded many for the rest of their lives. There were a total of 5,900 eye injuries that were reported and 41 people lost their eyesight of those. And then on top of that, the blast threw stoves and lamps through buildings across streets, and that caused fires to erupt throughout Halifax. Uh, in the north end of the city, entire blocks were burned to the ground when residents were trapped in their homes because they couldn't get out because the homes had fallen on top of them. So Billy Wells, he was a local firefighter, and he was thrown through the air in the explosion. He had all of his clothes ripped from his body, and he said, the site was awful with people hanging out of windows dead, some with their heads missing, some thrown onto the overhead telegraph wires. And again, it was, it was devastation throughout all of Halifax. Uh, the Acadia, Acadia Sugar Factory, it was located near Pier 6, and it was reduced to pretty much complete rubble, and most of the workers inside were killed. Then there was the Nova Scotia Cotton Mill. It was located about 1.5 kilometers away from the blast zone. It was destroyed by a fire, and its concrete floors actually collapsed. The Royal Naval College of Canada, which had only recently been built, was heavily damaged, and the students inside, many were maimed in the blast. And then there was the Richmond Rail Yards and Station, which was completely destroyed. 55 workers died, and 500 rail cars were completely destroyed in the explosion. Uh, the Protestant Orphanage suffered quite a bit uh, in this disaster. It lost its matron, and all but two of the children were killed. And then another 30 girls who are working for the Richmond Printing Company, uh, they were killed as well. And then at the Richmond School, most of the children in attendance were killed in the blast, but one child was blown through the through the ruins and essentially was unhurt. And you see a lot of stories of that, of these miraculous survival uh, stories of people who somehow survived. And there's one that I'll touch on in just a few slides, actually. So Cora Matheson, she suffered two broken legs, uh, had a dangerous wound on her head. And when the explosion occurred, she was knocked out of her father's house and fell on the road. And when she woke up, her fur coat had been taken off her body. So it might seem like that was a case of looting, but most likely what happened was somebody was wandering through the streets and thought she was dead. So they took the fur coat because it was the middle of winter and they were very cold so it was more use because somebody needed to keep warm than actually a, a case of somebody trying to to steal from someone then there's third officer uh, third officer myers of the british transport middleton castle so he was only 200 yards away from the explosion when it happened and he was standing on the deck and was about to step into a small boat to go ashore when he was hit by the blast and when he awoke, he was 800 meters away from where he was standing. All of his clothes had been blown off of his body, but amazingly, he survived. Uh, this year, there was a really great, very short animation film released by the National Film Board called The Flying Sailor. And it's this is a still from that. And it's about his flying through the air and surviving the Halifax explosion. And it was actually nominated for... Uh, an Academy Award for Best Short Film, uh, but it didn't win. But it was it's a really good film. It's on the National Film Board's page, and it's free to watch. I think it's only like eight or ten minutes, so definitely, definitely worth a watch. Then there was Private Henenberry. Uh, he had just returned home from the front, and he'd been wounded just a few days previous. So he was found digging frantically in the rubble and was reported to say, here was my home, and I'm sure I heard a moan a moment ago. Other soldiers then helped dig him, uh, dig, helped him dig, and they found that his 18-month-old baby, Olive, uh, was actually 
actually survived. She'd been protected by the protruding, protruding ash pan of the stove that completely shielded her from any wounds. And so while he was very overjoyed to find his baby, he soon found that his wife and his five other children had all been killed in the blast. So obviously newspapers reported on this heavily and one really good look at what happened comes from the Montreal Gazette. So it writes, a few minutes after the explosion occurred, the streets were filled with terror-stricken people trying to make their way as best they might to the outskirts in order to get out of the range of what they thought to be a German raid. Women rushed terror-stricken through the streets, many of them with children clasped to their breasts. In their eyes was a look of terror as they struggled on with blood-stained, horror-stricken faces, endeavoring to get anywhere from the falling masonry and crumbling walls. By the littered roadsides as they passed, there could be seen remains of what were once human beings, now torn and mangled beyond, re beyond realization of what had occurred. Now, Coleman unfortunately died in the blast, and if you've seen the Heritage Minute, it's, uh, you know that, but uh, he did save the lives of many people. So the train that was supposed to arrive stopped a safe distance from the blast zone, and it saved about 300 lives. But there was another thing that happened when Coleman sent that telegraph message out, is it alerted all these other places along the telegraph line about what was about to happen and what did happen in Halifax. So his message sent out before the tele telegraph lines were destroyed was responsible for bringing all incoming trains towards Halifax to a halt, but it also allowed for rescue and relief efforts to start almost immediately, which in turn began to speed up the entire process of bringing help to the stricken community. So he had two things that he did that saved a lot of lives because once that help and aid started to arrive, they were able to dig people out. People were able to get treated for their wounds and more. So Halifax wasn't the only place hit. There was Dartmouth, which was on the other side of the Harbor. Uh, it suffered heavy damage with about a hundred people losing their lives and several buildings were destroyed or heavily damaged. Then nearby to Halifax, there was the Micmac settlement, and that was located opposite of Pier, Pier 9. And at the time, many white landowners actually wanted to remove the Micmac from that location so that it could be used for development, but the Micmac had refused to move for years. So when the explosion happened, most of the physical structures on that settlement were completely destroyed and then were not rebuilt afterwards. In, uh, at least 16 people have also died in that settlement, but it's likely the number was much higher. And then once the rebuilding started, the, the Micmac were moved to other locations in Nova Scotia, and then that land was taken by Halifax and used for development because now it was empty and the Micmac weren't allowed to go back to their settlement. Then there was also Africville, and this was a black settlement that existed since about the mid-19th century, and it was actually, uh, there was raised ground to the south, so it actually spared Africville's direct hit from the explosion. But many of the buildings in Africville were very frail and several were destroyed and about five people died. And then when relief funds started to come from across Canada, nothing or nearly nothing went to Africville. And uh, the reconstruction of Halifax did not happen in Africville at all. It was just the people were left to rebuild on their own. And eventually in the 1960s, Halifax came in uh, and had everybody move out and then bulldozed the entire community and then developed on it. So due to the extent of the damage, uh, pretty much every vehicle in the city was put into service. It was cars, delivery wagons, trucks, and much more to collect the dead and the wounded. So Arthur Bemis, he'd suffered a broken rib in the explosion, but he didn't actually seek help. He instead used his car to transport wounded all day until he finally collapsed from exhaustion and was taken to the hospital. There was another man who was reported had half of his face blown away, and he just worked in the ruins to find survivors. And for days afterwards, uh, wounded were found in the rubble of buildings. One child was found on December 8th in the rubble of his home, and he was completely unhurt. Uh, another one, another six-year-old child was blown through the roof of his house in the explosion, and he rolled down the roof of another house and fell on the ground and only had a few scratches on his cheeks. Uh, another girl named Lola Burns, she was saying morning prayers next to her bed when the explosion happened, and the house completely collapsed around her, but the timbers fell in a way to kind of form a uh, triangle or a pyramid above her, and that actually saved her from being crushed, and then she was eventually rescued as well. 
So with the amount of wounded in the city, which was, like I said, about 9,000, hospitals were completely swamped with people and doctors and nurses and doctors were working for days on end trying to deal with all the wounded. At Camp Hill, a military hospital had 1,400 people admitted on December 6th alone. Uh, then there was the Chib- Chib- Chibucto Road School, which became the central morgue. And then the Royal Canadian Engineers, they converted the basement of the school into a morgue and the classrooms into the offices of the Halifax coroner. And then before long, the wagons and trucks were just delivering a steady stream of the dead to this new morgue. And Arthur Barnstead was the coroner in charge, and he had implemented a system that was created by his father, John Barnstead, uh, to number and describe the bodies. And that system was actually developed when the victims of the Titanic had begun to arrive in Halifax in 1912, and then was used again uh, during this terrible disaster. So one of the first organizations to respond to Halifax was the Royal Navy, and that's because there were so many of their ships there. They had offices there because Halifax was such an important place for uh, the First World War and the ships that were going overseas. So they would turn their ships into floating hospitals, and many wounded were brought aboard. The United States also quickly responded. The USRC Morrill, the USS Tacoma, and the USS Von Steuben were all in the area when they saw the explosion happen, and they all altered course to come to Halifax to help. And then in Halifax Harbor, the American steamship Old Colony was docked, and as it only suffered slight damage, it was also turned into a hospital manned by American and British doctors. Then there was a train from St. John uh, that was arriving in Halifax when the explosion occurred, but it was only slightly damaged and it was able to actually continue moving as far as it could until it reached the point where wreckage blocked the track. So at this point, passengers and soldiers took emergency tools and they began to dig people out of the rubble that were close to the track. Uh, They used sheets from sleeping cars as bandages, and that train would be loaded with injured people and then sent to hospitals outside of Halifax. And then, of course, famously, Boston responded almost immediately sending aid, supplies, doctors, nurses, everything that it possibly could in order to help Halifax. So aid came from Washington, D.C., New York City. Uh, There was a Red Cross relief train that was coming out of the city with five cars loaded with food, clothing, medical supplies. And then American soldiers from a nearby troop ship, they went into Halifax and they served as police in the streets because they were there to prevent any looting. But as you will find with disasters, uh, there's not a lot of looting. It's mostly people just trying to get by. A lot of people are actually helping each other. Uh, And with the Halifax explosion, there was nearly no looting. So they more or less were patrolling the streets for nothing. In Winnipeg, Mayor Davidson immediately called for aid from citizens to help Halifax. And a common thread throughout North America uh, was these communities all raising money, even the smallest communities on the other side of the country were sending things to help Halifax. Uh, The Winnipeg Tribune actually included a fill-in-the-blank pledge on its front page that just allowed its subscribers to donate any amount and just send it to the newspaper, and then that would be sent on to Halifax. And the Mayor Church of Toronto, he immediately offered any relief Halifax needed, and the Canadian government pledged a million dollars to Halifax on December 10th, with the funds being placed in the hands of the Citizen Finance Committee. So by noon, uh, the Lieutenant Governor Macmillan Grant and other leading citizens in the community had formed the Halifax Relief Commission. So we're only talking about three hours after the explosion. So this commission actually organized medical relief for Halifax. It provided food and shelters, and it also covered the costs of medical care and funerals. And then people throughout Halifax, they started to band together to begin to help each other. There were men and women worked in hospitals and shelters. Children were running messages between sites because the telegraph lines were down, the telephone lines were down, and they were kind of relaying messages throughout the city uh, to help people get organized and to you know let people know about somebody they were looking for who might have been wounded or somebody a family member who might have been killed and then to top it all off the day after the disaster a huge blizzard hits halifax it drops 41 centimeters of snow so while uh While it did help in some ways because it put out all of these fires in the city, it also 
took down the newly repaired telegraph lines. It also stopped these trains that were bringing people and supplies in, uh, stopped them in snow drifts. And uh, the, like I said, the only good news was that it put out fires in the community, but it was kind of an insult and injury for these people in Halifax who are now dealing with this massive uh, uh, blizzard. So like I said, Prime Minister Borden was uh, Halifax's favorite son. He was essentially born and raised there, not born there, but he was raised there. And uh, he came to the city on December 7th, and he found it completely in ruins. And he actually, many of his friends were missing and presumed dead. And he canceled two of his meetings to rush to the city to get to uh, consult with authorities and assist in any way he could. He assured the population of government help, which is where that $1 million comes from. And he canceled the rest of his election campaign because he just wanted to focus on Halifax. The election would still happen uh, in just, a, I think, a week later. Uh, but, and people in Halifax were still able to vote. But he stopped his campaign specifically. So he sent a message to Washington to thank them for their work, and he said, The people of Canada are profoundly grateful for the generous sympathy of the United States for the terrible disaster which has overtaken the city of Halifax, and they most deeply appreciate the splendid and which has been offered and sent from so many communities of our great kindred nation. So as... Uh, as people started to flood into the community that created another problem. And that was, there were too many people coming into the community and the telegraph lines were also completely swamped with messages from politicians, officials, loved ones, all looking for information about what happened. You had, I think the Toronto mayor had tried to send a message of offering to help and condolences about eight or nine times before it finally got through just because there was so much uh, telegraph traffic going on at that point. Uh, many telegraph messages simply didn't get through, and that had people across North America sending more messages to try and get some word of what was happening. And then you had all of these trains with supplies, doctors and nurses, and they were coming into the community to see what happened and to search for loved ones and to volunteer themselves. So eventually it got to the point where on December 10th, Halifax was asking that anyone with no business in Halifax to stay away from Halifax and all residents not engaged in relief work were asked to leave Halifax because there were so many people coming in. There was mountains of furniture and medical supplies and food and everything else. And it was just becoming too much to handle. And they had to essentially stop just for a little while to get things organized. So as soon as Halifax recovered from that initial shock, they started to investigate what happened. And uh, due to the fact that Halifax was so important to the war effort, most people assumed that the explosion was actually a German attack. And the helmsman of the emo was actually arrested on suspicions of being a German spy because he had a, supposedly had a letter written in German, which actually turned out to be Norwegian because it was a Norwegian ship. And within Halifax, German residents were rounded up and imprisoned on suspicions of being spies by the city police uh, because it was just assumed. It was, same thing happened in 1916 when Parliament, uh, the Parliament buildings burned down. A whole bunch of German citizens of Ottawa were arrested on the belief that they were spies and they had burned down the Parliament buildings when, in fact, it turned out that an MP had simply left a, uh, a cigar burning in a trash can and that caused the fire that uh, eventually burned down a good chunk of the apartment buildings. So corp uh, the Consul T.A. Hunt would say when he was discussing the possibilities of German sabotage, any man who is disloyal to Canada should be shot. German enemies in this country should be lashed and shot. They would not get away with disloyal acts anywhere else. And then on December 10th, uh, the Windsor Star also reported that all German citizens of Halifax are being arrested today. They were ordered into custody regardless of sex. Seven men and one woman have been arrested up to a late hour last night, and others are still being rounded up as rapidly as possible. And then even as the real reason for the explosion came to light, many still believe that the Germans were involved and wanted Germans in the community arrested, or in some cases, 
kicked out of Halifax completely. And it's important to keep in mind, a lot of these people had suffered just as much as other residents of Halifax, and they had no, uh, they, they didn't, weren't involved in the explosion at all. But at the point that didn't, nobody cared about that. It was the war. And the Germans, unfortunately, were the ones seen as causing this when that was not the case. So then that takes us to the Rec Commission's inquiry, which was formed to investigate the cause of the explosion. And that began on December 13th, only one week after the explosion happened. And these were presided over by Justice Arthur Drysdale. And then on February 4th, 1918, blame was put on the captain and the pilot of the Mont Blanc, as well as Mackey and the chief examining officer for the Royal Canadian Navy uh F. Evan Wyatt, Commander F. Evan Wyatt, and he was in charge of the harbor, the gates, and the anti-submarine defenses. So Justice Drysdale actually agreed with the opinion that the Mont Blanc was solely to blame for the explosion, as she should have avoided uh, collision at all costs because she knew what her cargo was, whereas the emo didn't. And also at the time, local opinion was very anti-French because of what I mentioned with the election and the issues over the conscription crisis. And that probably influenced the outcome quite heavily because in Canada at the time, uh, because there was not a lot of French soldiers who had enlisted, there was a lot of people who felt like uh, Quebec was not pulling its weight in the war. In reality, not a lot was done to get... French soldiers enlisted because they, when they enlisted, they had to speak English. They couldn't speak French uh, during training. There were very few French commanders. Uh, Sir Sam Hughes, who was the leader of the, uh, the Minister of Militia until 1915, 1916, was extremely anti-French, wouldn't uh, promote anybody who was French. So on both sides, there was anger. But with the explosion, a lot of the blame went on to the Mont Blanc because it was a French ship. So even though the emo was on the wrong side of the channel, it escaped blame in the inquiry. And Mackey, as well as the captain and the pilot of the Mont Blanc, were charged with manslaughter and criminal negligence. And then Benjamin Russell, a Nova Scotia Supreme Court justice, he found no evidence to support those charges and no one was convicted. Uh, today, we generally see that it was the emo uh, because the emo was on the wrong side and it didn't move out of the way. But at the same time, the Mont Blanc should have been a bit more careful because it knew what its cargo was. So the owners of both ships then embarked on litigation, uh, which they sought damages from the owners of the other ships. So Justice Drysdale once again ruled that the Mont Blanc was entirely at fault on April 27th, 1918, and appeals would go to the Supreme Court of Canada on May 19th, 1919, and then the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council on March 22nd, 1920. At the time, while Canada did have a Supreme Court, it was not the highest court in the land. That was the Privy Council in England. And that's with the person's case, which happened in 1929. Uh, even though Canada ruled against the famous five in the person's case, when it went to the Privy Council and they ruled in favor, that took precedence over the Supreme Court. So that's why we have two different courts here. And uh, it was eventually determined that both of the ships were equally to blame in the disaster. So reconstruction efforts uh, began almost immediately in Halifax, but the damage was so extensive that even by January 1918, there were still 5,000 people who had no shelter. So the Reconstruction Committee would build 832 housing units, and these were furnished by relief funds. There was so much furniture coming into Halifax that there was ample furniture to put into these new homes. On December 7th, partial train service actually returned to Halifax. And then on December 9th, full service began. So the Canadian government railways actually created a special unit to repair and clear the rail yards because even though this explosion had happened, Halifax was still extremely important to the war effort. And if you didn't have trains getting into Halifax, you didn't have troops getting into Halifax to get onto the boats to go and fight overseas. So they had to get the tracks repaired quickly. And then the piers in Halifax Harbor uh, would be back in operation about late December and then fully repaired by January. So the north end of Halifax was completely modernized after the disaster. It got more public access to green spaces, uh, low rise, low density, and multifunctional urban uh, developments within it. And a total of 326 large homes were built facing a tree-lined paved boulevard, all of which were built with fireproof material. And then due to reconstruction, the north end became kind of an upscale neighborhood and shopping district. And uh, you know, the, many of those buildings and homes still exist to this very day.
So there would be other benefits from the explosion. I like to kind of focus on some of the good things that happened, even though many terrible things happened. Uh, the extensive damage to the eyes would actually result in the Canadian Institute for the Blind becoming uh, having a surge in growth. Uh, it had only been created about 11 years previous, and it became an internationally known center for care of the blind, and that helped Halifax actually become a uh, a leading area for care of the blind. And again, that was very important because you had so many troops coming home from the war who were blinded because of their war injuries, and now they could find the uh, the care. It also helped doctors uh, learn how to treat severe eye injuries because of what happened and all the people they had to treat who had glass in their eyes. And then for decades uh, to come, that actually helped a lot of people keep their eyesight uh, because of what was learned during the Halifax explosion. And then pediatric care after the disaster, it was improved throughout North America because of William Ladd. He came to help and he used his insights to kind of pioneer pediatric surgery in North America because of what he learned helping people during the Halifax explosion. And then the explosion also resulted in health reforms, public sanitation improvements, and a focus on maternity care. One thing that's kind of lost in the whole story of the Halifax explosion was there was a number of premature births because this explosion was a traumatic event. A lot of people were shocked and it resulted, I think, in a few dozen premature births and those babies had to be cared for. So that uh, helped people learn a lot about maternal care. Uh, probably one of the most famous aspects of the disaster these days is the Christmas tree. So in 1918, Halifax sent a Christmas tree to Boston to kind of say thank you for everything you did to help, uh, especially to the Boston Red Cross. And then for decades, uh, this wasn't a tradition. We think it's a tradition that began in 1918, but it, it didn't. It began in 1971, and it was revived. And it's now the annual donation of a large tree is done from Halifax to Boston. So the tree is Boston's official Christmas tree, and it's lit at Boston Common, and that's it there. And the Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources has specific guidelines for selecting the tree, and one employee each year is chosen to oversee that selection. So it's a, it's a major deal for the community. So for Halifax, this explosion was deeply traumatic. A lot of people died. I mean, there was most families either had somebody die or knew somebody who died in the explosion. And a ceremony was held on that first anniversary of the explosion, but they would not be another one until 1967 for the 50th anniversary. Uh, then the Halifax North Memorial Library was built in 1964 to commemorate the victims of the explosion. And that was the first monument to actually mark the explosion in, in Halifax because Nobody really wanted to celebrate it or think about it because it was so traumatic. And then in 1985, the Halifax, Halifax Explosion Memorial Bells were built facing Halifax Harbor. Uh, and it's at this bell tower that the annual civic ceremony is held on December 6th now. And that's a picture of them right there. And then throughout Halifax and Dartmouth, fragments of the Mont Blanc are mounted as monuments to the explosion. In fact, there's a church, I forget the name of it, but there's a church in Halifax that has a piece of the Mont Blanc embedded in the wall and it's still there as a reminder of the Halifax explosion. So the legacy of this explosion, this was the largest explosion until we started playing around with atomic bombs. It was a 2.9 kiloton explosion. So if you want to kind of see what type of, how big it was, the Beirut explosion, uh, if you just search for videos of it online or on Twitter, there's plenty of videos of that explosion happening. The Halifax explosion was three times that size. So it was a massive explosion. And even when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the newspapers actually said it was, I believe, six Halifax explosions in size. So these days we say it's, you know, it's a million atomic bombs in size. Before Halifax explosion was kind of how we marked how big an explosion was. And it still remains the largest man-made accidental explosion in human history. So in 1994, a historian named Jay White, he looked at 130 major explosions in human history, and he looked at five criteria of casualties, the force of the blast, the devastation, the quantity of explosive material, and the property damage values. And then using that criteria, he stated that the Halifax explosion was completely unrivaled in terms of the overall magnitude with consideration of all of those criteria together. So that's the presentation about the Halifax explosion. I hope everybody enjoyed it.
Thank you, Craig. That, that, that was good. I really appreciate uh, the presentation. Um, maybe if you want to stop sharing your, your screen, then uh, that, that gets a chance for everyone to sure. see our profiles here. So. <laughs> So questions are a little bit slow coming in. Uh, I guess a lot of times that means it was an extremely comprehensive presentation. So, <laughs> Chris, you usually have something in the queue. What, what, what do you have as a thought starter? So, well, thanks, Tom. the uh, The first one I had written down um, was sort of the legacy today, but you covered that very nicely right at the very <laughs> end. So, uh, so thank you for that. Um, but I was curious to um, when you were talking about um, sort of the court cases and uh, and laying blame, was there ever any talk of um, sort of the the various navies, perhaps the Royal Navy being the the key one getting involved? Like, was there ever any talk of a court martial or, or that sort of thing? I know it's not exactly their jurisdiction, but some mm -hmm. you know being a Royal Navy port. Yeah, I didn't know if they uh, were involved at all. Not, not too, not too much. Um, like I'd mentioned, uh, that one commander was probably the closest that they came to mm -hmm. an actual uh, any type of court martial or anything like that. But again, was quitted of all charges. The issue was that even though you know it was kind of a Royal Navy harbor because we at that time we had a navy at that time, but we only had two boats and two submarines that were not great submarines. Uh, so we were kind of under the jurisdiction of the Royal Navy. And the issue was that the Mont Blanc was a French ship and the Emo was a Norwegian ship. So there, neither ship was really under the jurisdiction. You had McKay, the pilot on the Mont Blanc, uh, who I guess kind of would have been part of the Royal Navy, but he was more like a harbor master, a harbor pilot. So the Royal Navy wasn't quite involved in any kind of uh lawsuits or or blame other than just some of the rules around having ships with high explosives in there rules around the submarine nets and things like that but when you look at it there was other than allowing the mont blanc to be in the harbor with those explosives which was kind of a blanket thing that was allowed for everybody there wasn't really anything that the royal navy was involved in that caused the explosion um one thing i found really interesting i think what was it the ss clara was kind of not really involved in any of the uh, the debate of blame, even though that ship being where it was pushed the emo into the middle of the harbor towards the Mont Blanc. If that ship hadn't been on the wrong side, those two ships would have passed each other and the explosion would have never happened. Yeah, it's always a, in any accident, right? It's a series of events. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's never just one, one thing to blame. Um, now, speaking of that, were there um you certainly talked about some of the outcomes were there changes to sort of uh harbor safety ship safety munition safeties anything like that 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 came as a result of this not too much that i could find i think they kind of i think uh people were pretty leery about it about uh the concerns about it. but the issue uh was that the first world war finished before the 1918 was out. So any kind of rules that they would have put in would have only been implemented for a few months. And by that point, you were also starting to wind down. Uh, there were still troops going overseas, but the, the war was winding down by that point. So there wasn't as much traffic as 1918 went along. Um, I couldn't find too much regarding changes, but I would imagine there were changes to, to safety. But also, I think a lot of people were very wary and making sure they followed the rules going into the harbor. Because the rules were in place to make sure that everybody was safe and it was only you know a ship being on the wrong side pushing another ship closer and then those two ships colliding that caused this if the rules had been followed none of this would have happened right that's fair and i suppose to um with the u.s entering the war um and of course um i believe it was something like a million troops right from the u.s shipped shipped to the western front um, sort of late 1917, 1918. Did that sort of take some of the focus away from Halifax as well, even uh, before December? Yeah, it would have for sure, because it was only neutral ships that were going through the harbor. Um, and then once obviously the the United States entered the war, they were no longer neutral. So they could sh go straight from New York or Philadelphia or Washington, wherever it might be. It wouldn't make sense to go from there to Halifax, especially because they wanted to get the United States overseas as quickly as possible and get their troops. So we, for sure, once the United States entered the war, that helped to divert things. And uh, 
less traffic going into into Halifax. The peak years for Halifax were definitely probably 1916, 1917, when you had so much going overseas. I mean, 1914, the war had just started. 1915, you had a lot of troop ships, but 1916, 17 was really when things started moving. And then as 1918 dawns, you have the United States uh, in play, and those convoys can be protected by the United States ships and such, and uh, the traffic in Halifax Harbor would have started to decrease by that point. And I mean, the, it took until January before the harbor was like completely opened. So you were already losing some time and you would have had to have another harbor in place to, to deal with that. And um, a, a little beyond your, your scope here today, but uh, was was it similar in 1939? You know, was did Halifax again become sort of the center of North American shipping at that point? Yeah, because we had a lot of ships going through on uh, on convoys to the United States, uh, enough that the the Nazis started to come to the St. Lawrence area with submarines trying to sink our ships. Um, again, it changes with the United States entering the war, but even... Uh, you know, Halifax, for some reason, always has something that happens in a war. And in 1917, you had the explosion. In 1945, when the E-Day happened, you had thousands of uh, troops in Halifax went completely on a bender and just smashed up everything in the city that they could. They stole thousands of cases of liquor. I mean, it's not on the level of the Halifax explosion, but I mean, it did end the career of one of our most prominent uh Navy admirals, and it caused a lot of damage. But for some reason, Halifax, I don't know, has always something going on in a world war. Yeah, port cities, uh, I guess they they kind of they have to expect that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so somebody brought up um, a book. I wonder if you have any um, any recommendations just before I, I share this one. Uh, any recommendations for further reading? Yeah, um, there's a really good book. I think it's called Catastrophe. Um, I'm just looking on my, uh, my iPad here. Uh, I'm very sure it's called Catastrophe. Yeah, Catastrophe by uh, T. Joseph Scanlon and Roger Sardi. I think one of those guys has passed away, unfortunately. But it's a really good book. It goes into a great amount of detail about the disaster and what happened. And uh, when I was making my episodes, uh, episode about the Halifax explosion back in 2021, I used that book as a, as a reference. Uh, so I would really recommend that book quite a bit. I wouldn't recommend the TV movie that we made I don't know when that came out years ago. I know a lot of people didn't like that movie. Uh, felt it kind of messed up the facts a little bit. And then, of course, just check out the uh, Vincent Coleman Heritage Minute online. It's free. It's one minute. And it kind of tells uh, the story of uh, somebody who sacrificed their life to save a lot of other people. And we had um, Tracy recommended, I don't know if you know it, Shattered City by Janet Kitts. Do you know that one? I've heard of it. I haven't read it, though. Okay. Well, another one to add to your, another good to one. your list. Um, so uh, I just scrolling back quickly, I found one that I missed earlier. Sorry. So um, somebody asked, uh, why did the emo restart their engines? That's a good question. I think it's a case of the emo didn't know what was on the other ship. Nobody knew that that ship was loaded to the gills with explosives. So the ships collided at two kilometers per hour. So there wasn't a lot of damage. There was enough that the emo kind of went into the side of the, the Mont Blanc, but not enough that like, uh, like the Empress of Ireland, when it sank in the St. Lawrence, uh, when the Storstad collided into the middle, the Storstad made sure that it stayed as in the middle of that ship to plug that hole. Because if, if it moved out of that, it would cause the Empress to flood. And unfortunately, because of the current, they separated and that's exactly what happened and it killed a thousand people. So I think because there wasn't a ton of damage, he backed away, uh, not thinking that it was going to cause sparks because in his mind, the sparks, well, there was going to be sparks, but he doesn't know that the benzo is leaking over the ship or that it's even flammable. He has no idea what that is. So I think he was just doing most likely what he had been trained to do, which was just back away his ship and probably get to up here so they could assess the damage because not a ship was really that damaged. It was a like two kilometers an hour, even in a car, you're just going to essentially bump into somebody and probably be able to go on your way. So I think that's why he backed away. If it was a collision where he hit with like, 40 kilometers or 50 kilometers of speed and there was a massive hole he probably would have stayed where he was because that's the best way to keep both ships uh from sinking and it makes them stabilized in the water interesting all right well thank you so much um i 
think that I've covered anything, though I um, say to our audience every time, if I've missed any questions, I apologize. That's entirely my fault. And sometimes I get caught up more in listening to the presentation than, than following <laughs> the live stream. So I apologize. But uh, thank you so much. This was yeah. this was fantastic. And it um, an incredibly important part of Canadian history that um, I hope, you know, we had viewers from the UK and the US and around the world. And, and I hope some of them maybe uh, maybe something they didn't really know about um, uh, a part of our history that, that's very important to us, but, but maybe see, new to some of them. So. I see one question in there, and it was uh, ooh, it's hard for it to jump out. People continuing to put book suggestions into the chat. Thank you for that. Uh, there it is. Are the Memorial Bells uh, Carillon? I don't know. I'm not sure how to I don't know. That, um, so. <laughs> uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, what they're what they're made of or, or uh, what type they are i think they are that type but i don't know for sure all right well we'll wrap it up there thank you so much craig uh yeah. you know people can go back uh, one of your early slides you, you highlighted how to get a hold of you but i'll also put that into the the video details uh, as we, we close this out and, and uh kind of add it to our collection so a great talk Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Really appreciate all your support. And uh, I've seen a, a few new subscribers popped in there. If you haven't and you have the inclination, please do subscribe to our channel. It means a lot to us.